I am Indy Nidell, and welcome to another exciting episode of Out of the Ether, where I read some of the best or most controversial comments that we get on this channel. Now, this week, you guys had a lot to say about the French High Command. These are just two of the many comments we got. Number one, Sirliv writes, At long last, the lunatic imbecile Joffre is given the boot. Wow. For as much stink as von Hotzendorf and Haig get as some of the worst generals of the war, in my book, none of them surpass Joffre. His ideal that courage and fighting spirit could overcome anything, including being outnumbered and superior weaponry, were always unrealistic. But the fervor with which Joffre clung to such ideals, even when it was demonstrated time and time again that they account amounted to nothing, feel to my modern history student brain like nothing short of either pants on head stupidity, nice term, uh, inexcusable ignorance, inconceivable incompetence, or raving insanity. They didn't work. By 1916, he surely must have known they didn't work, so why did he continue to spout such blatant nonsense right to the end, and continue to do so in the speaking tours he would make to the U.S. after the French government fired him? Yes, I understand that. Much like has been said of Haig, he was dealing with situations for which there was no precedent, no reference for what else to do. But unlike Haig, Joffre had been in this from day one. He watched trench warfare evolve, yet it seems that he did not evolve with it. He learned nothing from the failures of these first three years and continued to try to use the same tactics that had been shown to be fatally futile over and over again. Good riddance to him, I say. It's only a tragedy that he wasn't let go a year ago before things got really bad for France. Wow. Um, okay, I'll, I'll read the second one too, and then maybe I'll say a little bit about my opinion on the... French High Command. I have a cold. Arthur Brogdon writes, uh, A couple of additional points about Nivelle's offensive. Only one, Mangin's Sixth Army, was in favor of it, out of the four army commanders who would be involved. Pitan was actually opposed. Also, the day before the offensive, the weather broke. For the entire first week, the attacking front would be deluged by heavy rain and sleet. This had two effects. First, to increase the speed of advance, the assault divisions had been stripped of their heavy coats and rain capes, and within 48 hours, huge numbers became ineffective, shivering masses caught in no man's land under German fire. Additionally, the weather prevented French aerial artillery spotting of German batteries on the reverse slopes of the Chemin des Dames itself. The commitment of the French tanks was an utter fiasco. They were deployed in two long columns nose to tail. Soon, a French infantry officer described them as a line of torches blazing fitfully in the twilight. Wow. The troops who suffered the greatest were the three colonial divisions in the first echelon of Mangin's Sixth Army. Unused to the cold and ill-equipped for it, the rain and freezing sleet during the night rendered them inert and thousands died of exposure. I knew that. Yep, we did mention something like that. Okay. Worst of all, Nivelle was so confident of a rapid breakthrough that the medical services were not available to handle the enormous casualty loads that actually occurred. Ironically, the small numbers of casualties that initially came back encouraged Nivelle to believe he was succeeding. The reality was the wounded were rapidly dying of exposure before the inadequate number of medical teams could reach them. Nivelle, despite his repeated promises of 48 hours and out, would continue the battle till May 6. By then, the mutinies had already begun and the French army would enter the darkness. For a detailed account of all of this, I highly recommend Breaking Point of the French Army, David Murphy 2015, available on Kindle. For an extended video, The Great War BBC 1964, episode 15, available on YouTube. That whole series is actually really good. This disaster was so great and the events that follow, the mutinies affecting all or parts of 62 French divisions, that the French government would seal all records of it for a hundred years. Yet what is now becoming available makes clear many unit diaries are missing. They were almost completely, certainly, deliberately destroyed. Not just regimental, but division and corps diaries aren't in the preserved records. All the papers of Nivelle's chief of staff, Colonel Dalancon, are missing as well. Before the attack, the French government had also begun to express grave reservations. Pan Levé, the Minister of War, met repeatedly with Nivelle and his subordinate commanders, but having engineered the sacking of Joffre in December, and having promoted Nivelle over a number of senior generals, in the end, went along based on the 48 hours or quit Nivelle promised. Catastrophe was set in motion. 
That's funny because somebody also wrote a comment. Uh, it wasn't a long thing for Out of the Ether, but a comment how they felt that Nivelle bore no responsibility for any of the mutinies and that his name has been un necessarily disgraced over the years by his association with with the events that happened during and after his offensive. I think that Nivelle could not have done a better job of disgracing his own name had he tried. Remember, after you know the first five days of the Nivelle offensive, not 48 hours and out, with 100,000 casualties, um, Pine Leve didn't make him stop the offensive for the time being until until, uh, what was it, April 25th? And that's when he was removed from, from, from power. But he refused to leave. He refused to leave his post. Even when Petan was appointed, Nivelle said, no, I'm not leaving. And he blamed absolutely everybody except himself, except himself. He took no responsibility for the catastrophe of the Nivelle offensive. Even though everybody had warned him, this is not gonna work, this is not gonna work, this is not gonna work. He even blamed one of his generals who had been against it to the point of insubordination and had almost been punished for insubordination for saying, don't do this, don't do this, this is a bad idea. And Neville tried to blame him. He certainly blamed Mangin. Mangin was dismissed. Um, yeah, as for Joffrey, I, I don't feel quite as strongly as you do about Joffrey being the, uh, the worst general of the war. I do feel there were plenty of worst generals. Um, and Joffrey's symbolism also did count for something. Now, I'd have to, we'd have to go into specific battles and stuff to really analyze that. I don't have time here. I'll tell you what. Um, why don't you guys, in the comments, address the Joffrey issue more? Because Nivelle, we've already got plenty of comments about Nivelle, but I haven't heard anybody write that much of a scathing indictment of Joffre uh, ever on this channel. So your opinions on Joffre will be very, very, uh, very gladly received. Okay, well, this was really fun. We enjoy well-written comments from you guys, but remember, the more controversial your hypothesis is, the more sources we will demand for you to prove it. If you want to learn more about a less controversial French general, you can click here for our episode about Ferdinand Foch. Do not forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. See you next time.